Hi, uh, thanks for coming and thanks for inviting me to Delhi Festival, Delhi Photo Festival, of which this is the second time, uh, second edition, and I'm very proud to be here speaking to you about my work. Um, I'm going to present my work uh, now, um, sort of contextualizing my Indian work so you understand where I come from and how I've developed my practice. I'm both an academic and a photographic practitioner, so a strange hybrid, which uh, I, I, I love uh, critical inquiry, inquiry and analysis as much as visuality and image. So um, I'll start now uh, with this first image, uh, which was taken in Kochi at the Paradesi um, Synagogue. So, um, I was, I was actually born in Germany uh, to American parents, and I grew up in Puerto Rico in the 1960s. And th these were very formative years, so I grew up in the tropics. So coming to India many, many years later, for me was like almost like coming back home. But of course, in a, a India is a, co a continent compared to an island in the, in the Caribbean, which of course was also and uh, is, I would argue, an, an American colony to this day. So I grew up in the developing world. So I, I immediately felt, like I said, at home when I came to India. But I then later uh, went and studied film and photography in London. And this formed uh, the way that I work now. But before then, I, when I was preparing my portfolio to enter the Poly of Central London or the University of Westminster, as it is now called, I, I enrolled in a sort of professional photography course that you could find in higher education colleges across the UK at that, this time. This was in the mid-70s and uh, built up my portfolio uh, in still, you know, all the sort of conventional studio f um, f sort of photography genre, using large format cameras, etc. So I, you know, in, in terms of um, the digital and the analog debate, I bridge both. I've worked in analog and digital, and I still uh, will work with analog cameras when the subject matter uh, needs to be worked in that way, uh, particularly when you're doing very long uh, exposures in very dark interiors, sometimes analog still is relevant. So um, I'll start with that very first series uh, called Punks that I produced with Olivier Richon, another um, colleague, a still good friend of mine who's uh, now head of photography at the Royal College of Art. So we met at this college and began to go to um, clubs in London uh, uh, w where this new phenomena had, had begun, which was punk music, which is very challenging and transgressive music. It tried to, it was a sort of music movement that wanted to be do it yourself. Everybody could just pick up a guitar and play. And it had very uh, aggressive imagery, which is really all about provocation and not uh, necessarily racist. Uh, a lot of the uh, swastikas put on the faces of these young people are often uh, just, uh, like I say, provocations where they use eyeliner or, or very often uh, paint that could be removed. Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the clothing was very much put together for uh, clubbing and listening to this music, which included pogoing, a bit like the Masai Mara to the music and spitting, there was a lot of spitting. I, funnily enough, I've just recently published a book of this work, uh, uh, which was quite unique for its time in that what we did was photograph the audience and not the celebrities of the punk movement. We were very interested in the clothes and in the performative aspect of how they posed for the camera. And they were taken in London b in 1977, uh, during January to March 1977, in all the early um, punk clubs, of which later uh, people like Vivian Westwood and Malcolm McLaren, of course, commercialized uh, a lot of it. And it became a fashion uh, item. And it's funny, one wouldn't have thought that punk would survive in fashion, but there's still stri traces of it today. When you wear spiky shoes or spiky bracelets, anything spiky, 
or torn is comes from th that uh, period. And this work was also shown at the uh, Tate Britain in uh, 2012, uh, part of a show called Another London, um, which was then, gi the, the work was given to the Tate by this collector who had been collecting all sorts of photography around uh, the theme of, of London. And I think Olivier Richon and my work was the only work that was collaborative um, documentary, and it's f quite rare in documentary photography for two people to work together. Uh, when we're asked uh, who took which image, we always say we, we both took it, and which we did, and, uh, and that's that. So following that um, series of photographs, the first sustained series that he and I ever made, um, which is now going to be published in a book as well, and be launched at Paris Photo uh, in November. I then, with this portfolio, joint portfolio with Olivier Richon, we both entered the Poly of Central London or the University of Westminster, where the, the curriculum really, I think, did change my life entirely because I had come out of a sort of self-expressive uh, art background in America where we were taught that uh, in photography it was all about self-expression or uh, sort of form and although I loved form and expression um, I found that there were more I began to understand there were a lot more important things in the world to use the camera for of which uh, was um, considering what documentary was so I, I began to um, uh, reconsider my whole, all my ideas about photography. And this is due to the fact that I had some extraordinary teachers at the University of Westminster, P uh, you know, conceptual artists, psychoanalysts, filmmakers, social theorists, were all there at this moment in time when photography was uh, being taught almost like an art humanities uh, subject. We did as much writing as photographing, in fact, uh, each year, you know, wrote at least 10,000 words of, uh, on, you know, analyzing the history of photography or particular uh, images, etc. And this was uh, part of the curriculum. You had to pass both to, to progress. I loved it. I, I found the theory and the, the analysis made, inspired my um, images. So the first work I did was called Belgravia. And it was really a uh, work that wanted to look at where I had come from as a classed and gendered subject. Because I noticed that one thing about documentary at the time was that it rarely uh, implicated the photographer. The photographer would often be white, male, would often travel abroad to the exotic, and often not even speak the language or understand the culture and photograph it. So I decided uh, to start with my own family and my home and where they had moved. My parents, being um, American citizens, had decided my mom loved um, London and had been there during the war as a photojournalist and a Red Cross girl and wanted to return towards you know, her later years. So my uh, father uh, bought an, an apartment in Belgravia. Um, this was when the property had gone, ver the property had once again gone very, very low, so it was quite relatively not as expensive as this neighborhood is now. So they moved there, and I began to uh, consider uh, what it meant uh, to be, you know, I guess, white, middle, upper class living in London in this environment. And I'm going to try, I'm wondering whether you can read the text. I'm just going to look, um, just barely. Um, can you read, because the, the, text, the text is really uh, about what the people in the photographs think about life and what they believe in. And this text with my mother and my grandmother uh, was very much a collaborative effort. In fact, all the portraits here are collaborations where the subjects and I would decide which room we would photograph, take the portrait in, and what they would wear, etc. And then I would work with the text with them together. The first personal pronoun, I, in, in many ways, at first being, you know, who, it, it, it referred to the people, obviously, in the photograph. Later, as I looked at the series, it began to, sh to shift and became very much a, a shifter, meaning uh, the first personal pronoun, I, can be me, could be an autobiographical account of my discourse 
on these images about what I may have believed in. And I'm using irony and humor here. For example, um, the ideal woman must be a mirror reflection of myself. I am really looking forward to my Deb party. Who is doing the looking in this photograph? And the work very often works like that, that you look at the photograph, then you read the text and come back into it. I'm part of a group called the Dulcet Drones. We're basically into rebellion, into changing youth today. This is what I call my Dutch master. Every morning I wake up and put on a white uniform, then basically what I do is keep house for Don Luis. I wouldn't vote for a particular party, but rather for a leader. I believe a woman should keep her kitchen clean. I walked into a friend's kitchen and saw two servants squeezing oranges, the sweat pouring off their foreheads into the juice. I did not allow my son to drink it. I know of a beautiful marriage. She likes his money, he likes her beauty, and is happy to have a beautiful item in the house. If I had such a marriage, I'd shoot myself. The interior represents the universe for the private individual. He collects whatever is distant, whatever is of the past. His living room is a box in the theater of the world. That's a Benjamin quotation, um, which I used there. Anyway, that series, um, there are about uh, 25 photographs with images and text. And the, the humor and the irony works across the series. And sometimes it's very sort of straightforward uh, quotation almost. But yet I've capitalized bits of the text to show that this, this text is a fiction. It's a construction as much as the image is a construction. And if you've noticed across the, the work, I've always used the same distance, the same lens. So there's this conceptual move in environmental photography that I'm making here to as almost a, a typology of a class. And it's not about individuals, but about social class. So not actually about portraits of celebrities, famous people. In a sense, I've always said this is non-portraiture because there are no proper names mentioned here. In fact, I've made the class, I've tried in a way almost disempowered the class by not naming the, the individuals. The next series was Gentlemen, which I uh, produced as I in, had enrolled after I'd graduated from the Poly of Central London uh, to do a Master's of Philosophy, uh, which I never completed, but I produced uh, the series of where I was looking at what uh, it meant to uh, be um, a, a subject in Britain. Um, remember that I'm an American gr that was brought up in Puerto Rico, so I've always been a slight outsider. And actually that outsider status is, is extraordinary and wonderful because it allows me access to places that I would never have access, like the Gentlemen's Club, for example, where um, I was very, they were very puzzled at what, what I was trying to do. In fact, I had to prove that I could take photographs at first before they let me proceed and show them my contacts and that I wasn't doing some sort of porn film or something there because there were a lot of people going into clubs and doing sort of nudes and things like that. But anyway, so what interested me here was discourse, was a way a particular class of uh, upper class uh, British men uh, positioned themselves and also this conservative discourse that was going on at the time. Margaret Thatcher was in power and these images were done between 1981 and 1983, also during the Falklands uh, War. Now let's see if, if we can, cannot, I'm going to read maybe one or two of, of these because they're quite, let's see if I can read them off the computer. Um, no, the, it's too small, but um, they're a bit, f the text is a bit fuzzy. But anyway, the text under the photographs is, is a fiction based on the John Hansard um, speeches uh, that were taking place during this period. Um, conservative uh, arguments uh, going on in Houses of Parliaments, and there are two voices in the images. One is the voice of the present, 
and one is the voice of the narrative, the historical. And this one, usually without people, is the past tense. And it, it alludes to a club member walking through the club and remembering how things were and a, for a, a sort of nostalgia for the empire. I'm sorry if you can't read the text very well, but I'll just continue going through them. Um, some of them I can read. Uh, Men are interested in power, women are more interested in service. He favored equal division of property except land. And all, um, oh, I can't read it. And, and all, oh, can, you can read it, okay. Orders of men except dudes which are a necessity. I can't read the, the, on the text, unfortunately. But the text, again, is very much part of, of the reading of the work. And these are images that were printed on the, uh, the text and the image is printed on the same surface, uh, silver bromide, 20 by 24 inches. I would use two enlargers, they're both first generation, very important for fine art. Uh, printing, black and white printing. I was really into printing them myself. I printed them all myself, as I said, using two enlargers and taking great care to create a sort of um, imagery that would be um, beautiful and attractive, but also with the text critical. The recapture of the territory is no more than an appetizer to the big match. These were the words of Sandy Woodward when he blew up the Belgrano during the uh, Malvinas conflict. And so on and so forth. So really examining what it meant to be a gentleman, what, you know, uh, resorting at moments obviously to, to exaggeration and stereotype, and also exploring issues of racism in the work. And also remembering that women also can uh, act. There's, I mean, gentlemen, Margaret Thatcher was considered clubbable. She was as if she was a gentleman. So gentlemen, the idea of gentlemen is not gender specific either in the end, particularly in terms of political power, as well as you all must know as being Indian um, uh, citizens. Uh, Indira Gandhi was a woman as well and probably acted like quite repressively, so women are not necessarily a better uh, race <laughs> at all. Um, and the next series I did was called Connoisseurs, and although I'd worked in color before the series, this was really my first solo work in color because I had done uh, work again with two other people collectively um, on uh, new towns in uh, England using a, nar a new sort of narrative form which I don't have time to show you here, so I'm mainly focusing on my solo work. Connoisseurs is um, um, a series of framed cibachrome photographs which explore the foundation myths of Western art history. Um, referencing classical myths found in the writings of Ovid, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey and the origins of the museum in Britain. So again, as an outsider, what I was doing with this work, I've realized in looking back on it, was really trying to understand what is Britishness, what does it mean to be a British, you know, it's being not, and trying to understand what discourses and cultural formations made this up and exploring it visually. So Connoisseurs, as I said, was an exploration of um, uh, of these foundation myths and also this, this collecting that was going on and how it linked to tourism, the early um, days of tourism, of where uh, the English gentleman once again would go across and bring back artifacts, plunder and bring them back and they became part of their collections and eventually part of the museums in England the genius of the place. Now this is um, also a strategy using um, uh, monkeys and apes are found in an old strategy found in, in Western painting uh, dating back at least to the 17th, 16th century where monkeys stood in for people and were like parodies of human behavior. And they're called in French singerie, which singe is, is French for monkey. So it's very much a genre within painting also I was referring to. And in a way, with my Indian work, I'm doing something quite similar, uh, you'll see, as I did with Western ideology, although 
it's of course a very different um, ideology and ways of uh, philosophies in, in India. But I, don't, in a sense, prepared the ground with this past work. The analysis of beauty, the invention of tradition. These were all taken in museums um, in London, in and around London. This one's the, the Sir John Soane Museum. This one's in the Dulwich Picture Gallery. Search for the true spirit of, uh, pleasures of the imagination, sorry. Thinking of something else. And then uh, Shattering an Old Dream of Symmetry. Here comes my feminist side where I'm having a Diana figure disrupt, cross the threshold, and uh, cast an arrow on an auction book which is placed in the uh, Chiswick House. Uh, the demise of logos. So this is very eclectic mixture going on between text and image and reference, but also quite an intense visuality and where I'm bringing in objects into interiors to comment on the, the, the interior and what it represents. So very interested in the display um, culture of, of museums and what they're saying as well. The work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. And again, this is um, a room in the Victoria and Albert Museum, which has all copies. They're all fakes. It's called the fake uh, gallery. It's a fake Raphael, fake you know, Michelangelo, everything's fake. Why? Because plaster uh, was a form of reproduction before photography. So if you wanted to show places to people that couldn't travel, you'd have them in a museum, of course, middle class white people mainly, but a little bit more. You would go to this gallery and you could, instead of having to pay to go to Italy, you could see the, 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 the work uh, in situ in, uh, in the, at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So I thought it was a great place to sort of uh, cite Benjamin's uh, The Work of Art in the Age of uh, Mechanical Reproduction because there's this parallel of an older form of reproduction, the plaster cast, which you can reproduce, but also reproduction paintings. Academies. Then I began to, after that series, I went, uh, began in, to work in another called Academies. Because I was teaching in art schools, I wanted to also, again, like in, within the family, my position within the family, looking at class in Britain, I wanted also to consider what um, education meant uh, in the arts and what, what were the ideologies and ideas that were circulating about art in the academy. So I began this work again initially in th at the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, photographing displays that are now dismantled. So now the documentary side of the work is back again. And this is the thing is having trying to do sort of form of critical documentary, I'm still using realism, but it's in a sort of trying to use realism critically. So here the imitation of life a Canova statue. This is the sort of a statuary that epitomizes a certain uh, culmination of the Greek ideal that European art loves. And people like a very successful artist like Jeff Kuhn, for example, who use this type of uh, figuration in, in their work. It could be called kitsch at moments today. Um, Butady's daughter. Now, Butady. Who is Butady? Butady is a um, is part of is the daughter of a potter that you find in a history written by Pliny the Elder, and it tells a tale of a young woman wanting to keep an image of her beloved, and what she does is trace his shadow on the wall. Except I'm a woman here. That's me, younger self, when I'm in 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 this is in the uh, mid 90s, tracing the 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 profile of a woman student. So I'm sort of reinventing that myth and appropriating it and turning it around in the Royal Academy of Stockholm. A model of vision. And again, referencing both uh, classical painting but also trying to subvert the, the space in which I have inserted this nude on a towel, a red towel that evokes perhaps blood. This is an anatomy theater in, in Uppsala University in the Gustavianum, um, space where they would dissect uh, corpses and teach medical students uh, you know, how the, the body functioned, which has is, which is now become a museum. And this, this, um, um, uh, the, and 
the 19th century, um, I was asked to then make a uh, part, I was commissioned by the Musée d'Orsay um, in the late 90s to make work that addressed its sculpture collection. So again, I began to uh, consider adding to the collection. And the way I added to the collection was to um, rent these uh, taxidermized monkeys, which I then placed in the museum context. And again, between image and text, and this time the, the, these objects are framed, and the text was found on brass plaques. The art functionary who's holding a, a, a quite a very well-known art historical book uh, called The uh, Genius uh, by Edgar Zizel. And this is uh, the artist, the model, the art critic, and the spectator. So again, finding a way of, of bringing in the spectator who's looking at the photograph too, because if the artist, the model, the critic, being the, 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 the chimpanzee to the right, and the spectator is us, so are we a monkey as well? So it, you know, trying to problematize, disturb this, the viewing, of, of the image by the captioning, as well as by the placing and addition of these uh, monkeys to the collection, the 19th century collection at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. And there's quite a long series, but since we don't have too much time, uh, I want to continue. The next work I did was uh, Sanctuary, which is also part of the Academy series, where I'm looking at a, a private uh, now public collection, national collection, where none of the items on display can be moved. So how, how to challenge that? Again, adding to the collection like I've done in the past by bringing in objects, in the, or in this case, animals like a wolf. Where have all the sparrows gone? High art after the deluge. in the green room, in search of Arcadia. What is human? The Judgment of Paris. The Judgment of Paris is a story that can be found in Ovid and, refers, and referred to in the Iliad. Zeus held a celebration for Peleus and Thetis, parents of Achilles. However, Eris, goddess of discord, was not invited, for she would have made the party unpleasant for everyone. Angered by the snub, Eris arrived at the celebration with a golden apple from the garden of Hesperides, which he threw into the proceedings, upon which was the inscription for the fairest one. Three goddesses claimed the apple, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite. Paris was chosen by Zeus to judge as he had proven his fairness at a previous competition. While Paris inspected them, each attempted with her powers to bribe him. Hera offered to make him king of Europe and Asia. Athena offered wisdom and skill in war. And Aphrodite offered the world's most beautiful woman, Helen, and sex. Of course, the Greeks' expedition to retrieve Helen from Paris in Troy is a mythological basis of the Trojan War. So that is one of the European origin myths that are referred to in this painting. But then, with the captioning, the judgment of Paris, perhaps the sheep is Paris? This is the um, installation of the work at the Wallace Collection where I was um, given the permission to transform the place and choose the color of the walls, which is called Bermuda Cocktail, which is a turquoise which echoes some of the porcelain collection in the museum. I also made for the first time a glass sound piece, which is called When Will We Ever Learn? And the whole work and the sound of this piece, it's a sound piece as well. Unfortunately, I don't have the sound, but it's based on Pete Seeger's uh, Where Have All the Flowers Gone, a 1960s protest song, which I synthesized, which uh, Blackbird sound to this melody, which plays in a loop over and over again. And in fact, the, the motif of, of one of the themes of this work is really is climate change and global warming, because during the period that I photographed uh, these um, 
animals, which are taxidermized, of course. We had the foot and mouth outbreak where in, in England where there were huge pyres of fires of these animals being burnt because of the infection. And it had rained for, I mean, from the month of, I remember in 2000, the month of October uh, 2000 to about March 2001, it seemed to ra rain every day even more so in England than usual. And so hence also the allusion to the flooding as well. And, and what is human again is a, a strategy I'm trying, where I'm trying to sort of trouble the, the spectator's position and a challenge. It's in a sense in a form of a challenge, as well as comparing the, the sheep, the baby sheep, to the two very sentimental photo, uh, paintings found in this collection. OK. And life class, also part of academies, which I photographed in the Royal Academy schools, where I pursue this idea of painting after nature, the singerie for the last time, really, where I do this, and the order of things. And then to show you a little bit of European painting and how it also inspired my work. Um, de de Hondekotter, who uh, painted the uh, collections of the animal menagerie of, of kings of his time. Again, one would almost say they could be photoshopped now. In fact, it's quite interesting. You'll see now that my analog photography is starting to become digital in the next um, series. And this uh, next series called Fables, which is the preceding series to the one that I've done recently that you all know probably called India Song, was really um, photographed with large format Sinar for the um, architectural space and then photographed with medium format cameras the, um, the animals um, and then scanned. So I had to use a scanner. I did it all myself, in fact. Didn't give it out to people, other people to do. And then I would place the uh, fox, for example, and the squirrel in and all the animals in. And this is called Ledoux's reception. And remember also that having grown up in Latin America, I speak Spanish and read Spanish literature. I was also very much not only influenced by European French surrealism, but also uh, magical realism by G uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who had written uh, The Hundred Years of Solitude who influenced your Salman Rushdie, of course. <laughs> the uh, corridor, the green bedroom, Louis um, says. The blue salon, Louis says. And again, in inspired both by the stories of La Fontaine, but also living in London where foxes run of, are very close to humans. They uh, live in back gardens now. They're probably going to soon be more foxes in urban areas, and they're surviving very well than in uh, rural areas where they're still hunted. The Queen's bedchamber, photographed again in cross museums in France. The music room, all mainly bit by bit live animals, birds coming into the work. So changing the way I'm working as it goes. The King's Reception, totally there. This is a document of, uh, I moved these two stags into the space. And then the series finishes off in Le Corbusier's Villa, Villa Savoie, The Passage, The Stairs, and Day Roll, um, uh, Melancholia, the fire that has hit a museum that uh, sells and rents a taxidermized animals in Paris, very famous, where the surrealists such as Dali borrowed their famous lobster and made that lobster telephone. I don't know if you are familiar with it. Um, Inferno, things burn, even collections burn. And these are the installations of my work. Um, in different ways. This is in a private gallery in, in Geneva. This was a, a survey show in Belgium to give you a sense of the different ways of, and I've always been interested in not going beyond this white cube aesthetic and using color in the work as well. And still, another 
display strategy where the work is inserted into the space of the museum. As you can see here in the museum, the Carnavale Museum, and rethinking the framing and the presentation of the work for a modernist environment where I designed very um, simple uh, aluminium uh, stops, which the work was just uh, it's just a diasec, a big diasec mounted and just on the f on the floor of this um, house where the photographs were taken. <coughs> so he's always interested in experimenting with display strategies, uh, trying to challenge the spectator's position in the work. And then India Song, which um, I may, you may or may not have known that I arrived in India in 2008 and I um, came with a, a woman friend and we rented a car and traveled to 16 different uh, sites in 20 days across Rajasthan. I had come invited uh, by um, Tazvir, but also inspired by a colleague of mine called Anna Fox, who'd been coming to India for many years and had set up a student exchange at National Institute of Design. And we co uh, we both uh, did MFAs. We had our version at Farnham, uh, UCA, and they wrote theirs and we collaborated with that and that was wonderful because it just gave me a sense of purpose and coming to India was not just was it under trying to understand the culture and also give back um, mentoring young uh, photographers t doing a bit of teaching as I traveled across and found these extraordinary sites and also learning about your origin stories such as you know reading bits of the Ramayana I'm not saying I read every page but I have familiarizing myself also with aspects of the Maharabata which are after all your your origin origin stories which have influenced ours of course finding that out through that the Pancha Tantra having influenced La Fontaine in <coughs> Europe and I'd have transverse, you know, sort of migrated across, back and forth through the trade routes. And here it goes, the Queen's Room, finding uh, places that I feel that I could um, photograph, again using a 5.4 camera, and then bit by bit as the series progressed, using a uh, digital technology, realizing that when I came to India, because it was more difficult to find stable wet processes, particularly color, unless you developed all your own work in, in black and white, it was a little bit more difficult. I just switched. I just said, well, I'm changing everything. And I began to, one, um, more and more work digitally. And like I said, now I just work totally digitally. Um, and I uh, use uh, paper, I print inkjets now. I, I don't use C types. And in fact, I uh, found out that C uh, inkjets last longer anyway. Well, all relative, who knows? A monsoon like today, nothing lasts, as you can see. <laughs> flight to Freedom, Durbar Hall, Juna Mahal, Dungapur. Why Flight to Freedom? Well, the work sort of has these allegorical undertones. And allegory means when you speak through one, one, you speak ambiguously, you speak in two ways, you say one thing through another. And Flight to Freedom, this bird is a woman in a male space, in a building. I realized how gendered, once again, buildings are in India, as they are in a different way in England, with the gentlemen's clubs, if you like. That this was like symbolically the public space where all the men and, uh, would speak uh, with the Maharaja and the women in many of these palaces would have their upstairs galleries behind screens where they could look down. In this case, not. This is a very old and quite lovely, very beautiful old palace in Dungapur. Over, it's about five floors, almost a tower uh, building with extraordinary uh, rooms, uh, with miniatures in, in painted in, sometimes photographs uh, imbricated into the walls uh, alongside semi-precious jewels and colored glass, quite magical, really. The Conqueror of the World in the Haveli in Nawalgar. Very interested in Shekawati. And actually, I'll be going back on this time to explore it further as it's changing very quickly, I'm sure, compared to the last time I saw it two years ago. The Gatekeeper in Samud Palace. Avatars of Devi. 
again in the women's place, uh, area of the palace. A place like Amravati, Udaipur city palace. Solitude of the soul. You can read the titles. What I found when I arrived to India was, you know, I would research, I'd seen coffee table books a bit with these, some of these interiors, but I found they'd never been really used in sort of in f fine art photography and that um, the other thing is that these places are not to be taken for granted. One earthquake, one big monsoon breaks the, the, the roof, it might all be gone and washed away. But it really is as part of your cultural heritage as your animal life. And I really wanted to get away from the Orientalist model of uh, photographing, let's say, uh, nude women in zananas, or maybe the exotic um, lower caste people in these environments. I was really trying to get away from this uh, Orientalism that you found, for example, in 19th century European paintings. So that, using the animal was quite a convenient strategy for me. And also that a lot of these animals are now, you know, threatened with extinction. And also referring to different religions, you know, like waiting for Atman, for example. Then, well, then there's another register going on here, the survivors. The joy of Ahimsa. The return of the hunter. There was this discussion in Rajasthan at one point of reintroducing the cheetahs. You all know the cheetahs now extinct, but it was brought over with a Persian, I guess, uh, Persian cheetah um, initially that then uh, became roamed wild in, in India and was used as a, a hunting animal by the Maharajas. And they thought of in reintroducing it, but they, I think they abandoned the idea because the Shida needs such a long, huge uh, sort of area to roam in. And also discovering the, um, the caves, you know, the Ajanta, Elora, it was just extraordinary for me. I mean, it's very unique. The, and Hampi here. And how to find a way of addressing these these sites in a sort of respectful way, looking at the culture and looking that there has been a tradition of using and having animals, sacred animals in temples, of course. So I'm not doing anything that um, unusual in, ma in many ways. And now, um, although I have a lot more of India's song, which I could show you, because I want to give you a total sense of the work I'm doing, i am also begun working in Japan and looking at the again the animals and the screen and the representations of art in Japan and thinking of making work there and I'll be going there in November to uh, continue uh, my work and I'm just beginning to uh, work like this but it's changing as well there'll be people in my work, um, and there'll be a reference to ukiyo-e um, prints um, called the floating world prints, which are about lifestyle of a certain era in in Japan. And I'm very much interested in how um, the the past really does coexist uh, with the present in Japan as well, where there's this incredibly traditional society in one so on one side, and with women still ha having a lot of restrictions to um, and very modern, highly advanced technology. So it's very, very interesting place. And these um, uh, birds have been um, uh, placed in, in temples um, uh, in uh, Kyoto, which are ex absolutely extraordinary. Once again, beautiful culture. See some of my books. And, uh, new book coming out uh, next year, published by Skira. As it's 3 p.m., um, how are we doing for time? Would I have time to show something about global art photography or just open it up to questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'll just do it really fast. Okay, the one thing I wanted to do was to show you that it's really important um, as a photographer uh, or an 
Mike is a professor, and and I've I've done quite well thanks to India Song. In fact, it's probably my most popular work ever. So, how to give back and thank with thanks, and how to sort of create uh, projects that can be uh, make photography more accessible. So, um, Anna Fox and I, professors and two of our students, we started the Global Archive of Photography, where we are, um, uh, I'm just going to exit this and go into the other one, where we are, um, it, and it's online now, we just launched it a couple of days ago, actually. It's, um, let me find it. Uh, yeah. We, we launched it with the five first uh, new works. And um, and what we're trying to do here is really um, open um, open photography up globally and really t be committed to a sort of global openness to photographic education. So the um, we publish portfolios. We choose people to to interview that we find are are producing really interesting work that often may perhaps doesn't even get seen enough. And um, sometimes, you know, we have in-depth interviews of um, up to uh, 4,000 words, which is quite rare for internet sites that show portfolios of photographs. So we're really l l approaching people who have something to say as well as producing very interesting um, photographs. So we have t uh, Taslima Akhtar's work, uh, some of her work, you know, you must all know her famous the last embrace, but this is she's been working on this subject matter for years. And this is the portfolio that we published, a sample of the portfolio. It's longer on our on our global uh, gap uh, our, uh, archive of photography. I hope you do look at it because it got a lot more information than I'm showing you here. Work of a Ghanaian photographer, Kaiwi Dumwa. Kufur, photographing the river in Accra and the pollution, which I'm sure you're all familiar with the Yamuna River. Here must be. I don't know whether it looks like this. This is pretty bad. <laughs> and he's doing these extraordinary abstractions with a 5-4 camera. He did this. And, but also photographing development in Accra. Ox, uh, Oxfam Road, he calls it. And the work of Maimuna Garesi, uh, who is a s practicing Sufi. Photo making photographs between um, sculpture and uh, structure, you know, staged photographs, extraordinary photographs. And Wasma Mansour, Saudi Arabian um, photographer, considering fem uh, feminine femininity and the problems of of femininity, of, of you know, Middle Eastern femininity of women who are um, unmarried and living in London. As you notice, her faces are always being covered. And also their shopping uh, delights, a whole series around shopping and the white bags. Single girl's life. <laughs> And the work of Kinez Riza, who's uh, Indonesian, um, who's made this extraordinary work in, uh, in the islands around uh, uh, Malaysia, Papua New Guinea, etc. She's gone into the uh, forests and uh, photographed the uh, tribals, tribal people, but also alluding to some of their origin myths. I met her at uh, Art Dubai and uh, found the work very, very strong. And we have an in-depth interview on her, uh, with her on her working methodologies. She's now going to the Arctic Circle to make work. Marge Monko from Estonia. Reworking the idea of the hysteric woman and femininity. Also, um, work, uh, you know, uh, uh, labor and changing uh, times in Eastern Europe. Okay, thank you.
can i ask you a question in the meantime yeah, sure, if you could sure. just tell us the technique uh, you use for india song okay um as i said initially i i used a sign rp3 camera yeah with plates yeah then i discovered great fuji chrome you know the one the the slides that you could just you didn't even have to load in the in the slides which is great uh, what are they called quick slide quick quick loads wonderful because no dust you know the big problem in mm -hmm. india of course is dust yeah. but now they've you know discontinuing this very hard to find all the stocks are gone even on ebay whatever so when i went to japan i discovered some yay can buy some but they're not going to so knowing knowing that things were changing you know so i'm having to adjust because i'm an, an image maker and and i you know i want to continue i'm not going to let digital you know i have to change with the times and it's interesting it's really challenging so so half and half so first the the animals were taken with a nikon d3x uh, which is a great camera and bi and fast photography really fast photography then the images of the um of the architecture very slow sometimes 10 and um, there are hours waiting for the light seeing the light sometimes three hours waiting around for the light to be right and then the lights right and still quite dim so photographing 10 seconds to 30 seconds sometimes up to a minute or two so very good to use you know uh five four signers that are very easy to do these long exposures and you have something called reciprocity happening as well so you have to over exp you know expose longer for film but uh, digital works quite different i mean digital you can you 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 you, you can expose it what you don't have the same reciprocity elements happening so there's some good really good things about digital shifting over to digital till because now technically i use a phase one camera and a uh, Nikon uh, 800e, which is perfectly all right. It's all I need. And phase one 180 is like an 8x10 camera, so I'm even getting higher quality than I ever did with my Sinar. And doing a lot of the work, the process of the thinking of bringing it together is on the computer. And if I may just ask one more question, Amit, uh, uh, link to that only. Uh, and how do you source your animal photographs, one, two, uh, and do you think of where to... I'll Place you, which animal in... I'll tell you in a minute. I get, I try and photograph animals wherever I can find them. Sometimes on the street, sometimes, you know, when I'm driving across, I stop the car, you know, we stop, we get out, do that. Just wherever I can find them. Sanctuaries, zoos, every... I, I have a... I make uh, pilgrimages to zoos cons every time I come to Delhi. I have to go to the Delhi Zoo, you know. Elk. <laughs> I'm there for hours and hours. And also in you know, reserves, I've got you know I've gone to several reserves. It's very more difficult to take f animals in reserves because they're usually further away, and then you've got all these issues of technique shake, etc. And, and I need what I need for my photographs because everything's so sharp in the interior. The animal has to be totally sharp, so I have to be close enough get close enough. So often the best place for me to take them, and I sometimes take risks, much to the dismay of my, my partner, of photographing lions or tigers quite close up in jeeps. It's problematic, but often, you know, one time was quite problematic because the jeep, the person in the jeep was trying to show off, <laughs> sort of annoy the, the t you know, that wasn't very fun, but I got some interesting shots. But <laughs> I don't really like to work that way. In fact, uh, the the reserves I tend to like best are the ones where you, they're not hunting the, the the animal as much. But then it's hard to to get get the animal close. So wherever I go in any country in the world, I'm always going to the zoo and spending hours and hours trying to get the shot so that is is right and tight enough with all the everything in focus to fit. Wait, I'm mean, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, do you think of, I'm sorry, thanks. Oh, yeah. how do I place them? Okay, it takes... Yeah, which exactly, animal to place exactly. In which I setting? don't know initially. Yeah. Initially, it's like I'm working parallels. I'm photographing the animals. I'm photographing the places, yeah? And I'm not, I'm, I'm not entirely sure right away which animal goes where until I sit in front of my computer. It's a bit like... 
It's a bit like painters going out and sketching, or you're taking notes, and then you come into the studio and you start putting together. You're crafting, you're trial and error, thinking about the stories, reading about the stories. Oh, well, this, will, this one will, like Humayun's tomb, for example, I did one with a white black buck, an albino black, it almost looks like a spirit. You know, thinking of things like that and being, what, how, when you're photographing near mosques or Muslim tombs, you have to respect, you know, there's certain animals you cannot photograph there. So having these knowledges, making sure that I don't insult anybody either. So I have to play quite safe that way because, you know, out of, res especially in India where there's this such, such a mixture of the sacred and the secular. So uh, very often it does happen when I get back home. I don't have a sudden flash, ah, the white tiger in the sunken temple in the temple of Shiva. I didn't know. I didn't even know whether I got the, the white tiger sharp enough to go in the Shiva temple. But I do know that the underground Shiva temple, I walked through the water, I tried to photograph the other side and this and that, you know, I explore the space for some time. So in a way, I really, and what I do is I immerse myself arc in the, sp arc the, the, the stories and the space for time, immerse myself in, the, in an animal life in a way, in different registers of animal life from, from you know, as I said, zoo street or sanctuaries, and then back home starts coming back in together. It takes sometimes months <laughs> to bring them right. You know, there's one of the, which I don't have here, but is in my exhibition at, uh, at the Oberoi, please go. It's, I know it's a very posh and iffy hotel, it's the guards <laughs> and all that, but actually it's really nice to see that there are a few images really large and you can see them close up. The two fighting tigers, that took age in a temple, Hazar Hazarama temple in Hampi, and I was very interested in all the, the you know, also the history of the of Vijanagarara empire and how there were all this infighting going on so the lions become like these fighting uh you know uh, clans if you like in the temple so so it's a, it's really imagination and the imagination gets cultivated by the on field work mm -hmm. in india t talking with people being in those places uh, reading about it and and just experiencing it and then back with a distance in the, at home in the computer. Sometimes in India, in the, on the computer, it starts coming together. It's a very interesting statement you made about how you find a very tight fit between the sacred and the secular in India. Uh, of course, in India, we're made to believe that actually it's very apart. I but that's another it, story. Yeah, <laughs> Amit, it's a debate. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm Amit Madesha, and thank you so much for sharing your fascinating work. Uh, you mentioned uh, magic realism and uh, Gabriel Gesha Marquez as, as, uh, as an influence, as an inspiration. And uh, I can totally see that in the images because w w they, there's a mundane image, there's an everyday image of a temple or something, and you bring in this mm -hmm. magical element to it. And I can totally feel it and experience it. But uh, my question to you is that when I look at these images in a sequence and when I, when I try to imagine myself in a room full of these images, then I think then the work speaks to be with much more of a surrealist overtone. So that is something. Uh, uh, That's my European. There I go. Yeah. That the <laughs> fact is, I'm an outsider, and I I can't you know I can't say that you know I'm learning about Indian culture, but it's so complex that there's no way that I can even reach it, except through the tinted glasses of my my own culture but trying <laughs> yeah it's true it's true and and then guess the other critique would be that it's almost formulaic now what you know how long can i keep on doing this there's got to be a shift there will be a shift you know it'll but, suddenly but be yeah. a but something. when i say a uh, surrealist or thing, i also enjoy that yeah 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 so yeah, yeah. I, I but maybe you yeah. guys invented surrealism <laughs> <laughs> Was Meaning, you know, magical, you know, yeah. it is, it is, it is in that place between secular and, and profane, uh, sorry, profane and sacred. It is, in a way, it comes yeah. out of that, in a way. Yeah. Transgressive, you. too. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see any other hands? Uh, you said that you're going to photograph humans in your next... Uh, 
trying to yeah, yeah okay so <laughs> did trying this, to get back to humans uh, did this thought ever cross your mind photograph humans and place them in the zoos and sanctuaries like completely opposite of what you're doing right now yeah it's been done by a really good artist in europe it's hard that's the other thing you know being working within uh, i'm thinking of no that very good uh, comment actually and and possible why not absolutely um there uh, it's 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 about territories and how you put you know make work unfortunately being like well, I show my work in art fairs and in galleries and stuff all over the place right so I have to be really careful that I don't out of respect that I'm not going to plagiarize another artist and there's been other artists that have done that really well and I feel that if I go into that it's almost like the opposite so I need to find somewhere else in a way not just the flip opposite, but good point. Definitely deserve to be in cages, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Hi, Fauzan. Um, I have seen your earlier work at Tasweer. The show with Obra I haven't seen as yet. Is it totally new work or you've bought the same thing again? No, no, it's new work. Absolutely new work. There's there one piece that he put in, which is the old, which is the peacock in the green room. That's only strategy to get people to come into the place. Because it's such an obvious, <laughs> it's my most obvious image, let's face it. But it's also probably the most popular because it's quite readable quite quickly. So as you look through the glass door, you see the peacock and then you see another one, which all the others haven't, haven't been seen. Okay. So there are 30 new images. I promise to go there. Please. <laughs> <laughs> How many uh, works do you have there? Have you uh, How many? About 30, yeah. Oh, okay. And four really large ones, so four, four foot by six. So that's where the work comes into its own, because you see every detail. And that's why all those hours of, of weaving the, the animal in the space are crucial and working. I work with one really good retoucher, and I, I cut and paste and try, and then he does it, and then brings it back all on my FTP site photo transfer protocol, you all must know it. You can just upload and quite large files. The other person downloads, does it, and uploads. <laughs> you don't even have to be in the same country. <laughs> so that's how I work over, you know, quite a period. And sometimes need time and space to consider. So, you know, sometimes you just have to do something else and look again and, oh, this works or not. You got them printed in India? Yes, all of them are printed in India by uh, Ranbir Singh <laughs> at Digital Solutions. <laughs> who incidentally is the one who's printed all the publicity. paper prints which you see in the VGA and all He's the other galleries. He's a really good printer, really good printer. To do some internships with students there so they learn how to print. He's really good. People have, to want, people have to want to print and get off the screen and see it on paper too. It's beautiful. And and you know, that's yeah. the other thing. It's this really, this, the, you know, uh, and you have to also accept that when you print, there's a catalog for the, the show as well. And I'm always very disappointed. There are always some that don't reproduce that well in, in relationship to the print. But then you have to see the book is one thing which people can see and get a sense. And then the exhibition's another, and so they're different experiences. And then the computer online is a different experience. So there are all these different experiences which make up photography today, and they're all great. I'm, and I'm right in there in the social media too, you know, it's wonderful. It's part of photography. Uh, that's a very important statement for all the young photographers in this room, really. I think about it, it's, it's a very important thing to bring into your work, to see it in other mediums and not just on the computer screen. Uh, time for one more question, if we have one. Yep, I've got one yeah. last question. Hi. Now, um, the animals are fascinating. So the question here is, I've got two questions. Number one, uh, you mentioned taxidermy. So at which point did you decide to move away from using stuffed animals and install uh, animals later on in post-production? Good, good question. Number one. And number two, this is a little off the corner, but have you ever considered using live animals? I have. Oh, they're all live. All my animals in India song are live. Live animals in the frame. <laughs> yep. His mouth almost fell open. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, but coming no, back to but the But not <laughs> photographed separately. They're live. Okay. And then brought into the, the interior. 
as you know, I can't photograph them live with all that quality that I want, especially when I'm printing big. So you must go to my exhibition over to see what I mean. I have to photograph them separately because I can't get the level of detail. They'll move if I'm doing exposures of 10 seconds. I'm not going to get an animal in the interior, even if I train the animal. <laughs> right? Absolutely. It's hard enough with humans. <laughs> And any experiences working with stuffed animals? Um, yeah, that's what I did because um, that was the way I worked f in Europe at a certain time. And then I found that I was bored by it. I, say, I said, you know, like the challenge each time with new work is to make something new, is to innovate. How do you push your boundaries? How do you challenge yourself? Don't stay in one place. So photographing animals is much more difficult. Birds, like those hummingbirds, forget it. It's like a nightmare. But that's the challenge, you know, it's to try and do it. The part of it, for me, anyway. It's what I like. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. There's one part of his question which you didn't answer, Karen, which is that when did you feel the need to transition from the stuffed animals to the live? Bit by bit. Um, in fact, there's, there's, there's one stuffed animal in India song. It's a cheetah sitting down, looking out the window. And that's the only stuffed animal, and then uh, and that's extinct, so I can almost justify it for that. But then I photographed another live cheetah and put, you know, but so. But um, whatever it it takes to make the the shot look believable and work, really. Uh, but I just find find it uh, photographing animals and ex and studying animals even and learning about them more interesting than photographing them dead corpses. I mean, it's quite nice to have dead corpses all over European museums. Not so nice in India. Was it difficult finding stuff that? Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes long time negotiating it. Yeah. Usage, rental, whatever. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, Karen. Thanks Thank a lot you. for a very fascinating presentation. <laughs>
And this work was also shown at the uh, Tate Britain in uh, 2012, uh, part of a show called Another London. Uh, I mean, back home, but of course, in a, uh, India is a, co a continent compared to an island in the, in the Caribbean, which of course was also, an, uh, is, I would argue, an, an American colony to this day. So I grew up in the developing world, so I, I immediately felt, like I said, at home when I came to India. But I then later uh, went and studied film and photography in London, and this formed uh, the way that I work now. But before then, I, when I was preparing my portfolio to enter the Poly of Central London or the University of Westminster, as it is now called, I, I enrolled in a sort of professional photography course that you could find in higher education colleges across the UK at that, this time. This was in the mid-70s. And uh, built up my portfolio uh, in still, you know, all the sort of conventional studio f um, f sort of photography genre, using large format cameras, etc. So I, you know, in, in terms of um, the digital and the analog debate, I bridge both. I've worked in analog and digital, and I still uh, will work with analog cameras when the subject matter uh, needs to be worked in that way, uh, particularly when you're doing very long uh, exposures in very dark interiors, sometimes analog still is relevant. So um, I'll start with that very first series uh, called Punks that I produced with Olivier Richon, another um, colleague, a still good friend of mine who's uh, now head of photography at the Royal College of Art. So we met at this college and began to go to um, clubs in London uh, uh, w where this new phenomena had, had begun, which was punk music, which is very challenging and transgressive music. It tried to, it was a sort of music movement that wanted to be do it yourself. Everybody could just pick up a guitar and play. And it had very uh, aggressive imagery, which is really all about provocation and not uh, necessarily racist. Uh, a lot of the uh, swastikas put on the faces of these young people are often uh, just, uh, like I say, provocations where they use eyeliner or, or very often uh, paint that could be removed. Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the clothing was very much put together for uh, clubbing and listening to this music, which included Pogan, which was then, the, the work was given to the tape by this collector who had been collecting all sorts of photography around uh, the theme of, of London. And I think Olivier Richon and my work was the only work that was collaborative, um, documentary, and it's for, quite rare in documentary photography for two people to work together. Uh, when we're asked uh, who took which image, we always say, we, we both both took it, and which we did, and uh, and that's that. So following that um, f series of photographs, the first sustained series that he and I ever made, um, which is now going to be published in a book as well, and be launched at Paris Photo uh, in November, I then, with this portfolio, joint portfolio with Olivier Richon, we both entered the Poly of Central London or the University of Westminster, where the, the curriculum really, I think, did change my life entirely because I had come out of a sort of self-expressive uh, art background in America where we were taught that uh, in photography it was all about self-expression or uh, sort of form. And although I loved form and expression, um, I found that there were more, I began to understand